Teen mental health is in crisis. The latest data shows an unprecedented rise in suicidal behaviors and depression among adolescent girls and LGBTQ plus teens in the U.S. We look at what's driving this alarming trend and the latest programs aimed at addressing the critical need for school-based mental health professionals. That and more, stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hello and welcome to Your South Florida. I'm Arlene Bornstein filling in for Pam Giganti. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and while all people, no matter their age, race, or background, can struggle with their mental well being, the latest data from the CDC shows U.S. teens are in the midst of a nationwide mental health crisis, and the issue is significantly worse for girls and LGBTQ teens. In 2021, almost 60% of female high school students reported experiencing persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in the past year, and 30% of teen girls seriously contemplated suicide. The numbers are even more stark for LGBTQ plus teens. Nearly 70% experienced feelings of sadness or hopelessness and 45% seriously considered suicide in the past year. So what are the factors behind these alarming trends? Joining me now to discuss this and much more is Catherine Murphy, CEO of the Palm Beach County Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI. We also have someone else virtually, Amanda Kopaz, who you work with, peer specialist for NAMI of Palm Beach County. Amanda is also a trauma-informed yoga and mindfulness teacher and social work intern with Broward County Public Schools. Thanks for joining us both here today. Thank you. Catherine, uh, NAMI PBC has noticed these trends, people reaching out for help, teens uh, especially. Can you tell us more about that and what you've been noticing? Certainly, so prior to the pandemic, a lot of the calls that we received were from caregivers or family members who are worried about somebody else. Since the pandemic, we've had a huge increase in calls of people who are calling for themselves, who were feeling lonely, isolated, feeling anxious, depressed for the first time. And so we definitely saw a huge rise in that. Wow, uh, it, it is alarming. And Amanda, through your roles with NAMI, you've also seen the same, correct? Yeah, absolutely. With NAMI and with the, the Broward School District um, being within the environment is a little different. <laughs> and you communicate with the community on a daily basis. What are some of the big stressors uh, going on affecting teen mental health that you see each day? Uh, oof, absolutely. I would say um, they're overall just, they're very dysregulated. So everything that we sort of knew as normal got flipped upside down. And I don't think there's really been an opportunity to get back to any sense of real normal. So that's a lot of it. Uh, I would say that they're struggling with, you know, things that we've all heard about, things like social media, uh, a lack of sleep, and part of that does have to do with social media and having, you know, to get up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning to catch the bus to school. I think that's a big wow. factor. Um, there's a lot of instability in the school system. We have a lot of uh, teachers that have left the profession, so a lot of the students have sort of permanent substitutes and kind of don't know you know, who, <laughs> who they're gonna have from one day to the next. So there's just so many challenges. I don't, I think the kids are res responding very naturally to very unnatural circumstances. To your point, there is a critical shortage of mental health professionals and social workers in public schools, uh, which is only making things worse uh, throughout this mental health crisis. Tell us, Amanda, more about the work you do specifically for Broward students and the need for mental health professionals and social workers uh, throughout the district. Absolutely. So the work I do, it varies from one day uh, to the next. Um, overall, I, I offer support and that support can be, you know, emotional support and developing coping skills. Um, it can be supporting uh, the heart program, which is our students that are either homeless or in some sort of housing transition or instability, you know, making sure that they're able to physically get to school, that they have school supplies, they have shoes and other essentials. Um, I you know, support kids. Basically, I tell them in any aspect of their life that's not academic, but is all affecting their academics and affecting their success. Um, another thing I do is trauma-informed yoga and mindfulness classes during their lunchtime. They can come voluntarily. I always have a big group of students, even though they self-select to be there. Uh, and they find it really helpful just to have an opportunity to feel 
safe, to feel calm, to learn how to regulate their nervous systems. So that's been something that's really helpful as well. And, you know, Catherine, as you're hearing Amina talk about these issues and, and the shortages, how do you fill the gap at NAMI? Maybe not you specifically, but your team of people there. Um, how do you address these, these issues for our community? So we support students in two ways. One is we have a presentation called NAMI Ending the Silence, and we go into middle schools and high schools and talk to students about early warning signs of mental health conditions, what to look out for, how to start conversations with their friends, with their school staff, with their families, <clears throat> and we also introduce them to the mental health professionals at the school. In addition, mm -hmm. we work with their families. We have support groups, classes. We can answer the phone and talk yeah. to family members and mm -hmm. help them to navigate the mental health system. We have a crisis guide, which can help the parents to understand what to do in case of a crisis. And we um, have just a ton of resources to help to educate them so that they can best support their child. Yes, that sounds wonderful and something that these children really need at this very difficult time. You know, you think you're out of COVID uh, and, and, and that isolation, but the lingering effects of that uh, is really what what seems like we're talking about here among so many other things that affect mental health. Amanda, you've long been an advocate for mental health. You just received your master's in social work. Congratulations to you, such great work. Uh, what was the turning point that led you to go kind of all in to help the community? Uh, I would say that there are layers to my journey. Um, you know, I came into mental health as an advocate based on lived experience. You know, I come from Two things, I come from a long line of helping professionals, a lot of nurses and teachers. I am not the first social worker in my family um, and also a long line of mental health challenges and conditions. So a lot of major depression and bipolar in my family um, and including uh, a, a child. So I've survived multiple suicide losses amongst my loved ones and I have a daughter that survived a major suicide attempt about seven years ago. And that's what kind of uh, lit a fire for me to be more vocal. I was kind of a quiet advocate and became a very loud advocate. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that led me to my volunteer work with NAMI and then eventually working with NAMI and doing a lot of um, education and outreach and support. And I found when I was trying to refer individuals and families for uh, specifically things like trauma therapy or therapy for individuals with persistent mental illness that we just didn't have enough local providers so i decided <laughs> eventually i could be one and i i went back to school i i went back uh for graduate work for my master's in social work and and that's that's my long-term goal is to be a, a trauma therapist especially um what what that's yeah what right more <laughs> could be a bigger inspiration than you know, our children and people who are so close to us, our loved ones. So thank you for your bravery and seeing what's going on with your own loved ones and moving that forward. I think a lot of families watching right now can connect with that. Um, and, uh, you know, Catherine, that type of support that families need. Uh, for example, you know, I may come in uh, and ask you about a personal, you know, situation that we're going through. Um, what should families expect when they walk in? What, what type of programs or initiatives may they be met with like right off the bat? Sure, so they can start with a phone call to our office and find out what it is that we offer and maybe we offer them the resource that they need and if not, mm -hmm. we can also help them to navigate the mental health system within the county and if we don't offer something in Palm Beach County or if they need help outside, there are 24 NAMIs in Florida, over 600 throughout the country, we might be able to help connect them to a resource where they do live. Specifically for parents, uh, you know, a, a teen daughter having tr trouble, mm -hmm. what may they, you know, be able to do? So we have a support group. It's on Zoom every Wednesday night, and all of our groups are led by and for people with that particular type of lived experience. So we have family groups, which are led by family caregivers for other family caregivers, or we have support groups by and for people who are living with or experiencing mental health conditions. And so a family who came to us, they might start with our family support group. And they, like I said, they can attend on Zoom from wherever they are, the comfort of their own home. We also have classes that help to train them, educate them on the ins and outs of this journey of supporting wow. somebody with a condition. What's the community telling you? You know, what's been the feedback as of late? You know, you hear these startling numbers. Um, what's been your experience with NAMI, PBC, um, in our own community? So what I hear, we just did a big survey on our support groups and the biggest comment was that we help to give people hope and that we help them to feel less alone. 
and that there are other people who understand what they're going through. A lot of times mental health conditions are very private conditions people go through. We say that they're not a casserole illness. People don't bring you a casserole if your child is in the mental health hospital or if you go through a crisis or have a relapse. Mm -hmm. And so at NAMI we understand what that is like to go through these tough situations and to try to reduce the stigma and help people feel like they have a place to go to, a place where they can talk about these things. So Amanda, you're the boots on the ground. You help people different levels within the Broward County public school system, also through NAMI. You've been dealing with this with your own family. So what advice, valuable advice, would you give to parents and caregivers for children who are going through these mental health struggles? For one thing, if I reflect on what advice I needed as a parent, it was to really pay attention um, I think for a little while, I maybe overlooked what were symptoms and, and kind of delayed getting help um, because I just thought it was normal teenage stuff. So I think that's one of the amazing things NAMI does is the education around what is a mental health symptom and what is kind of typical adolescent behavior. So I think that that is part of it. Um, having the conversation, having very open conversations, and I know sometimes that is tricky when we're talking about teens, but really uh, leaning into affirming their experience. You know, what they've been through over the last few years, none of us experienced in our youth. So I think it goes a long way to, to validate that they're struggling. Um, so I think that that opens up conversations. I would say, uh, don't be afraid to have the hard conversations. If a teen is asking for help and support, I wouldn't delay. I would start looking for that support um, a very common experience I have with the, the students is, you know, they have families that don't want therapy, that don't, you know, don't believe necessarily in, in mental health conditions. And that makes it really challenging for the kids that, that do want support. So, you know, just being open-minded, it's like any other, you know, health condition. We have a lot of components to our wellness. And just like we wouldn't delay, you know, if we had a cavity growing, we would go see a dentist same thing you know if there's something developing in the realm of mental health um you know there's no shame there shouldn't be any stigma in seeking support for that absolutely and Catherine, how can the community support nami's mission and all the wonderful things you you do to build off of what Amanda just said, to start by being stigma free. So to recognize at home, in the workplace, at the office, that people experience mental health and behavioral health challenges and to be there and be supportive of them. One way that we're doing that is in May, we have the Get Your Green On campaign. We encourage everyone to wear green, which is the color for mental health awareness on <laughs> May 18th to show their support Wonderful. and to just start those conversations. And people can always reach out to us if they need support. And we're gonna have a huge community community event on November 4th at John Prince Park in Lake Worth, NAMI Walks. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity for people to come out and meet us, talk to other people who are involved in this movement, and to find out where to get resources and help. I've heard of NAMI Walks, excellent event, raises good money for a great cause. And um, I just wanna say thank you to both of you for you know, shining your bright light for so many people who may not have it right now. So again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, according to the World Health Organization, half of all mental health disorders in adulthood start by age 14, but most cases are undetected and untreated. Fortunately for Palm Beach County resident Maddie Tassini, her parents took her to a therapist after first having suicidal thoughts in middle school. But an unexpected mental health crisis more than a decade later left Maddie and her parents distraught and searching for answers. Now Maddie is on a mission to help others navigate their own mental health journeys. Take a look. Is that everybody? Yeah, I think so. My name's Katie. Yeah. I don't, I don't see Steve and Marlo. Oh, yeah. look at how tiny I was. Well, you were tiny. <laughs> I would say I was always a little quiet, but very curious about life, just trying to figure things out as a kid. I had very few friends, which was really hard. It took us a while to get it out of her. She really like didn't want to talk about it and we knew something was wrong. I told my parents one night that I wanted to um, die. I guess we <laughs> tried to remain sort of calm so we wouldn't frighten her and um, talk to her about it and why she felt that way and what was going on. I was very scared. I didn't have a plan or anything. It was just like a thought and so I knew I had to tell my parents so they decided to take me to a therapist. I think it helped her quite a bit. Uh, she did not express you know any real ideation of suicide or really talk about it too much and that issue went away. 
I love yeah. this picture. I do too. Yeah. My psychosis started when I was 26, 27. Being home, living here for like two years with her parents during COVID, she was really not very happy. No, no indication of any kind of psychosis that I noticed at all. Leading up to psychosis, I would isolate in my room a lot, just reading books all day long. Um, I was very unhappy. I was getting migraines a lot. One night around 5.30 in the morning, she came into our room, my wife and I were sleeping, and she said, you need to stop talking about me. And we're like, Maddie, we're not talking about it. We're sound asleep. Go back to bed. And then she said that she had heard we were talking to her sister who lives in Colorado. And so then I knew something was wrong. And I was very unaware of it. Like, I didn't know what was going on. Shock, surprise, fear, um, uncertainty, you know, not really know, knowing what's going on. So, yeah, it was difficult. Three days later, I decided to go to the ER. It was one of the most horrible experiences I ever had. They didn't treat me for 24 hours with a psychiatrist, so I was just sitting in bed hearing voices all day long. And so then my parents just took me out and I went to um, an inpatient facility for 30 days. I don't recall how I found NAMI. One thing that was really helpful, they had a training education program for like six, eight weeks, where every week you would meet with a facilitator and a group of parents. You know, the stigma that's attached to mental health is, is still very prevalent and so that's very isolating. That really opened our eyes about it and that other people were very willing to share. So, you know, that was very, very helpful. Once I got off the medications and once I started like functioning back to my normal self, I don't hear voices anymore. Mostly I just hear thoughts that sound like voices, um, but I can tell a difference now. Nowadays I'm in therapy and I go to family therapy with my family. It's really helped me a lot just learn how to cope with going through psychosis and just I'm still recovering from it but it was really one of the hardest experience I ever go through but it made me really strong. And she's fantastic. She's um seems much happier. She's now pursuing her masters become a licensed mental health counselor. So she's she's doing great. I think NAMI actually really helped me decide to go back to school because when I first got out of my mental health struggle with my psychosis, I took a peer-to-peer -peer course which helped me like learn about medication, how to cope with my anxiety and my psychosis. Nowadays for NAMI, I facilitate groups as a peer group facilitator and I really enjoy doing that because it gives me a chance to like help other people in my own shoes. I also started joining a running group which I really liked. I'm actually a certified yin yoga teacher which really helped just like calm and relax my mind. I also run my own business called Mental Health Wizard where I'm a mental health coach to help people in recovery. I would tell parents to find as many resources as they can and to find as many doctors as they can because the health system here for mental health is really not that great and I have experienced that firsthand. I have a really good psychiatrist now who's excellent and without any of that help I wouldn't be the person I am today. In response to the critical shortage of mental health professionals in public schools across the country, earlier this year, the U.S. Department of Education announced they were awarding more than $188 million to 170 grantees in more than 30 states. Among the recipients, Florida International University received a $6 million grant to help improve access to mental health services for students throughout Miami-Dade County Public Schools. With these federal dollars, FIU's Project DIG will help recruit and train graduate students to work as school psychologists and social workers. Joining me now to share about this new initiative is Dr. Andy Pham, Director and Associate Professor of FIU's School Psychology Program and Principal Investigator of the grant. Dr. Pham, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. As we spoke about earlier in the program, there is a critical need for mental health professionals and social workers in the school system, in this case, Miami-Dade Public Schools. Let's talk about the job of social workers in a school setting and why they're just so important. Absolutely. So social workers are uniquely, uniquely trained to provide services to support social and psychological needs of students. That's really the primary goal for all school-based mental health professionals. So school social workers they collect information from families about students' um, social and developmental history. They work with students individually or in groups, and they also help manage any crises that might occur in the school. Uh, they handle issues related to trauma, parental divorce, uh, substance misuse, bullying. So mm -hmm. school social workers work alongside uh, professionals, teachers, administrators, and a team and they advocate for uh, students' well-being. So they essentially provide the link between home and school and community. 
Um, so they're necessary in a school setting as they are trained mental health professionals and they can identify concerns earlier on and to provide mental health supports uh, sooner than later. With so many of the issues you just mentioned, uh, it's sad to say there is a shortage of these professionals. How is it impacting students? Right, so similar to teacher sh shortages, this puts a strain in the school system in trying to meet uh, children's mental health needs. Um, studies have shown that one in five school-aged children may have a diagnosable mental health disorder. And the CDC uh, released data from a national survey indicating that one in four high school girls reported uh, seriously considering suicide. Um, and almost half of LGBTQ students surveyed considering attempting suicide. And there have also have been increases in bullying, students feeling anxious and depressed during and after the pandemic. So a lot of current mental health professionals are feeling the strain because unfortunately we are not able to meet the needs of every student um, if we don't have enough of um, school social workers and school psychologists in the schools. Well, talk to us about the federal funding received and Project DIG. What's the goal? How will it help MDCPS students and FIU grad students? And how long will that grant last? Yeah, so Project DIG, it stands for Demonstration Innovation Grant. So it is a five-year grant uh, provided by the U.S. Department of Education. And it's also part of the Mental Health Service uh, Professional Demonstration Grant, which is made possible by the Bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act. So this is in collaboration with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, our school psychology program and the school of social work here at FIU. And the main goal is to recruit and financially support uh, graduate students who are really committed and really excited about uh, coming to FIU to learn the skills to become a mental health um, service professional, either as a school psychologist or a school social worker with eventual um, goal or path to employment um, with Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Uh, so it's a, a great collaboration between our respective graduate programs and the school district. That's so nice to hear that they are so excited about it and to go out there and help people who need it, especially children. Um, what makes this program unique? Yeah, so in addition to being a, a collaborative uh, project with our programs, we are able to provide financial supports uh, to graduate students, including tuition waivers. We're able to uh, provide um, payment for field experiences, um, including internships for students in the social work program or in school psychology. And one of our missions uh, is to ensure that students that we work with um, are successful. So particularly those in marginalized communities, those in poverty. Um, as we know, Miami-Dade County Public Schools is a, a rather diverse uh, community of students. And sometimes mental health can be a stigma uh, for many families. And so sometimes we have to train our students to know how to navigate some of these barriers um, to ensure that uh, our graduate students are sensitive to these issues and also to identify existing strengths of, of children that we work with in schools, particularly whose uh, cultural background might be different from, from our own. Um, how can grad students apply to be a part of the program? Yeah, so um, we do accept applications each year. If, if um, interested applicants search Project DIG FIU, uh, we do have a website with more information about the application process. If interested people um, are wanting to apply to a particular graduate program, whether school psychology or school social work, it does provide links to our respective graduate programs. Uh, my contact information is also on the webpage. Um, so, a lot of the information can be um, found on that website. What would you tell people who may be interested in pursuing a, a career similar, similar to this in mental health or social work um, to pursue that career? What would be your message? So our message would be if you're interested in working with children, with families, and in order to ensure that students are successful, I think this program would be for you. Uh, we're able to provide as much support as we can, as we know, uh, graduate school can be quite expensive. And so we're doing our best to alleviate some of those costs so that um, a lot of our children and youth are successful in schools. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Pham, and all that you do. Thank you for having me again. And for more on FIU's Project DIG and the mental health resources discussed on today's program, find us on social media at Your South FL. I'm Arlene Borenstein. Thanks for watching.